cleans my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you In regards to the night about the Holy Ghost, this is uh, uh, something very, very dear to me. Um, and I've been able to, ex I've experienced personally, I came out of a Catholic background and, and uh, got saved when I was 28 years old. When I was 31, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost without any teaching, without anyone messing with me, just reading the word. And I did have a man pray with me. But I saw a man by the name of David Ingalls, and some of you may remember him. I was involved in full gospel businessmen in the 70s and 80s when, when Dina Shakari and all of that group was a really, really strong anointing on that group. And David Ingalls had a ministry where he would, I saw him on several occasions pray for people who received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I prayed to the Lord. I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I'd like for you to better use me to do that. Same as I asked him about casting out devils and a lot of other things that is in the word. And he is faithful, as you guys well know. He's very faithful. And so I'd like to start out, and I do have this book that I'm working on, and it was a teaching that I taught. And um, I'd like to start out with some testimonies because I actually like to start out with the word. And since Dave has already prayed about blessings on the meeting, and I, I've been praying all day today, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to move. Uh, in First Kings in chapter 18, verse 21, it says, And Elijah came near to all the people, and he said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him. And that is exactly what happens to church members. Not that you're following demons and all that, but what has happened is, is you've listened to teachers and teachings that say that the Holy Spirit is not for the day. You listen to teachings that say that apostles and prophets and uh, those ministries, those offices are not for today, and they're not what you're being taught is not scriptural, and so therefore, the the more you you buy in to something can't be real, then the experience doesn't happen to you, and and theory never stands up to experience. So, what happens is. God asks a question. How long are you going to be between two decisions? A lot of you tonight, that's really where some of you are, is that you're trying to make a decision about where are you about the Holy Ghost. And if he's real, I want him in my life. And if he's not, I don't want him in my life. And, and the whole crux comes down to whether you speak in tongues or don't speak in tongues or any of those things, when actually what God really wants us to do is seek the Holy Ghost. That's what he wants. He wants us to seek the Holy Ghost. So you have 1 Kings 18.21. How long are we going to halt between two opinions? And then we have 2 Timothy 3.5. And if you go to 2 Timothy 3.5, you find where the church, the bulk of the church is today. And we start with 4. Actually, you probably should start with chapter with the verse 1. It says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, and unholy. And he's talking about the church. He's not talking about the outside people. Unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. And he goes on and explains some of these guys. But here's, here's the thing. If Jesus walked into our church, just like he does when he's down, when Dave teaches and when Dave is around and you have Dave pray for you and you have men that are in the ministry down there pray for you and you have others that are in the prayer teams that pray for you, they believe what they're praying. They're not just saying it, they believe it. And consequently, 
If you will grasp that, then you can receive. So I like I like to go back in time a little bit and and um, talk about and the things that I, I'm going to share with you some testimonies about people getting filled with the Holy Ghost and then I'm going to teach about it because I think you need to hear um, how people receive because there's no set method. The only criteria for receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is you must be saved. You must have joined the family of God. You must have heard God call you, and you must have turned your life over to him. And you will find, as we go through this, you will find that's exactly what, is, what, what has happened. My wife, Priscilla, I had, when I met her, I had been teaching the Bible for probably 13 years, and I had seen people get filled with the Holy Ghost in groves. And, and she got saved at a Norman Williams uh, meeting at Full Gospel. He was a man that escaped an uh, airplane crash in the Tanarifi Islands, Canary Islands, and two planes, two jets uh, ran in, into each other on the runway. She gave her life to Jesus at, in that meeting, and then I began to pray for her to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and she let me lay hands on her, and we anointed with oil, and we did all the things that we thought that we needed to do, that she needed to do to receive the Holy Ghost, and she could not receive from me. But one of my friends prayed for her, and nothing happened, but she went to sleep, and she has the ability to back up her dreams, to rewind them. I don't have that. But she has a dream, and she doesn't like the way it's going, she can back it up and she can change it. Um, so she was asleep that night and she dreamed that she was praying in tongues. And so she said, well, look at this. And so she backed it, her dream up and she heard herself do it again. And then she backed her dream up and she heard herself do it again. And then she woke up and she touched me and she said, listen. And she began to pray in tongues. Now, for those of you that have had that experience, or if you've had a dream, you're not sure what you've had, if you've had it in tongues and you've been prayed for to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, that may be the way he does it for you. For me, I got saved at 28. I went to a prayer meeting when I was 31 with my father-in-law. And this man kept saying, there's a young man here that wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's the first time I'd been in a prayer meeting that lasted three and a half hours. And after he asked for three or four or five times, I finally just made a statement. I said, I wish whoever that is would get up and do it because I'm ready to go home. And my father-in-law reached down. The place was packed, and we were sitting on some steps. And my father-in-law reached down and touched me on the shoulder. And he said, Rex, that man is talking about you. And so I said, I'd already made a commitment to the Lord when I got saved that whatever he wanted to do and whatever he wanted to do in my life, I was going to let him do it. And I began to avidly began eating his word. And he sent me up to an upper room, uh, an A-frame house. He had an A-frame house. And I went up in this upper room with a woman there. Her name was Mrs. Brown. And he knelt down in front of her and talked to her about if she was saved and that, that uh, went through the whole, questioned her about her salvation. When he was assured in his heart from the Lord that she was saved, he laid his hands on her neck. And the minute he touched her, she started praying in some language I'd never heard of in my life. And my eyes just bugged out. And he talked to her for a while, and then he turned to me, and he asked me the same questions about being saved and my love of the Lord. And... um didn't ask me anything about being baptized. Didn't ask either one of us. Um, but I had been. And, um, which is not a criteria for it, by the way. And for him. And he laid his hands on my neck and he prayed the same prayer he prayed for her and nothing happened. And I kept hearing her. And I kept thinking, well, if he'll do it for her, why won't he do it for me? And what's the problem? And, some of you out there probably have had this happen to you. And so after about 15 or 20 minutes in this upper room and nothing happening, and I, and I began to get a little bit perturbed because this woman was really, she was just 
he couldn't keep her quiet. I walked over to this big the window that was in the safe room. It was a big hole window on one end, on the A-frame window end, or the end of the house with the A-frame. And I could see this huge pine tree, and I began to look at this pine tree, and God magnified the bark of that tree to where it appeared like it was almost right directly in front of my eyes. And I began to praise him about how beautiful the bark of that tree was and how beautiful the tree in totality was. And out of my mouth came these words, da-da. And I thought, how ridiculous for a college graduate running your own business to be walking around saying da-da didn't make me feel good and it didn't make me feel bad but i know it didn't come from my mind so after about six months of data i went to the lord in my prayer closet and i said you know father i'm i don't know what this is all about but you know if this is real i need more than dada and i began to praise him and worship him and just to tell him how much i loved him And in an instant, just like in the instant when Dada came, in an instant, I had a full-blown prayer language, which has changed over the years. Over the last 35 years, it has grown a lot, and depending on what's happening and what I'm doing and what I'm praying for, the language changes. Another instant is, as I was taught a Bible class, and the reason for the book is this neuropsychologist who went to high school with me, Heard that I'd gotten saved and I had, I was changed and he came to find out if what he heard was real. And he got hooked in the class and the classes used to run from seven o'clock in the evening till eleven, twelve. It had gone to one a couple of times and Priscilla made the statement that she was, it was on Tuesday night and she made the statement she was tired of me getting home so late. So I told the class the specific night that I um, couldn't stay late, but I was teaching on baptism. I was teaching that you get saved, you ought to be baptized, and what baptism means. And at the end of the class, which ended at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock, he, Lynn Arx, the neuropsychologist, made the statement. He said, well, who can do this? Who can baptize? And I said, well, anybody can do it. Well, can you do it? And I said, yeah, I can do it. And he said, well, there's a swimming pool right outside. We want you to do it right now. And I said, well, listen, guys, I'm in trouble with Priscilla about coming home late all the time after class. And I'll come next Tuesday, and when we come, that's the first thing we'll do. And he said, no, we're going to do it right now. And it was in the winter. This guy had a heated pool. So all of my ploys to not do it, God was erasing them one by one. And so finally, after them persisting with me for about 20 minutes, I said, okay, come on, I'll do it. So I got up, no bathing suits, and I got up and uh, I turned around and all 12 of those men, there were 12 men and some women, but only the men did this. They got up, they followed me outside as we were walking outside, they were stripping down to their undershorts. We walked into the pool and we made a confession of faith and I baptized them in water and every one of those men, this is a happening that happened when Peter was talking, every one of those men came out of the water, came up out of the water, speaking in tongues, and none of them had the same language and none of them had been taught one word about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Another instance where the Holy Ghost is when he is free to do what he wants. In full gospel, we used to have six, seven, eight hundred men and women come to the meetings in Lafayette. And at the end of the meeting, we would always, the businessman would always ask, the, the, the speaker who was given the testimony would always ask about salvations. Then he would turn the meeting back over to the president, and the president would say, how many of you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? And of course, there were hands upon hands. In this particular meeting, when Norman Williams had come to speak, there were a thousand people in the in the auditorium. Three hundred of them asked to be prayed for for the baptism in the Holy Ghost.
I took them into a room, and they were men and women. I took them into a room, and I asked, we talked about salvation. Then I asked them, I said, you know, the word says if you ask, you'll receive. If you knock, it'll be opened. If you seek, you'll find. So I said, I want all of you to ask the Lord with your own mouth to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And we will pray. But you ask him, and we will pray. And in unison, they they asked. And I said, Father, you heard what they said. I ask you to do what they said. And I give you the praise and the honor and the in the glory, Father. And every one of them instantaneously got filled with the Holy Ghost. There was no teaching that night either. I was fortunate to go to Jerusalem and I got, I went to where they think is the upper room where the 120 were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the first group, this was in 88, and the first group that was in that room had the opportunity to teach on whatever they wanted to teach on. And so we happened to be the first group. God had it planned. It just didn't happen. He had it planned. We were the first one in the room. There was another group that was from uh, another country that did not speak English. They didn't have one English-speaking person in their group except their interpreter. And that was just a second language to them. And the pastor that I was with said, Rex, I'd like you to teach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, because this would be an appropriate place to teach. Now, whether that was the right room or not makes no difference. God honors faith. And so I taught. Basically, some what I'm fixing to do, and I finish giving you these testimonies, but what I want to do is, is let your heart be blessed. If you've been seeking, you will find. If you will be not, if you've been knocking, he's going to open. He's going to do it because his word says that he will. And if you've been asking, he's going to do those things that you ask. So I taught, and this guy, these people were standing on these steps. You go down into this room, and these people were standing on these on these steps. And uh, as I would teach, he would interpret to them. And at the end, I asked how many of you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There were about five in our group. One lady was about 82 years old. And um, at the end, I asked them. They, the ones in our group said yes, and I never did hear what happened to the other group. I mean, how, what they asked, but I heard our group. And so we prayed, and the four that asked all received. But the thing that was really got all of our attention was is that all of them on the staircase received the baptism in the Holy Ghost because we all heard them speaking in English, and not one of them there could speak in English. And everything that they spoke was praising and honoring God. So take courage, because if you have not received the Holy Ghost, and there's some error in teaching that that's in the church that says that, you know, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Ghost, and you receive all that you're going to get. Well, that's not true, Okay. It was three years after I got saved that I received the Holy Ghost. It was several months after my wife got saved that she received the Holy Ghost. It was many, many, many months after this Bible class that they received the Holy Ghost without teaching. And I don't know how long it was for the ones that were in uh, the 300-member crowd. And I do know for the lady that was 80-something years old had been saved since she was about 25 years old. So... She had been taught that that couldn't happen. So let's go to um, the name of the little the book that I have is Have You Received Since You Believe? And um, we're gonna I'm gonna make it available to I'm I'm trying to get it done I really am I'm trying to trying to get it complete because it's not another book on the Holy Ghost it's a it's a book of just the scriptures so that you can receive that which God has so freely given unto us. Um, let's look about where it really starts in the word. If you'll go to Numbers eleven sixteen, see people when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost or you receive the Spirit of God, something's gonna happen in your life. Something is going to change in your life. 
So in Numbers 11, starting with verse 16, the Lord therefore said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the Spirit who is upon you. Now, there's only one Holy Ghost. There aren't many, okay? And I will put him upon them. And they will bear the burden of the people with you, so that you shall not bear it all alone. And say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. He goes on and talks about the meat to eat, and we jump to verse 25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took of the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the seventy elders. And it came about that when the Spirit rested on them, and here's the key that you need to split this. You see, Jesus wants to knock us out of our comfort zone. If you get comfortable, if you get comfortable in church to listening to lies, then you'll believe a lie. And the lies that are being told about the Holy Ghost are so dangerous because in Him is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church. And we'll go through that. All of that's written in the New Testament. And it came about that when the Spirit rested on them, mark this down, they prophesied. They prophesied. And then it also says, in uh, further down, in verse 28, it says, Then Joshua the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses, from his youth, answered and said to Moses, My Lord, restrain them. There was two men that were not in the group that were back in the camp that were also prophesying. So the Spirit of the Lord spilled over on them, praise God forever. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. So if you have this, if you, if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, then let's just say you don't speak in tongues, then you ought to be prophesying. That's just one proof text right here. But we're gonna, we're gonna go through several more. Let's go to, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 10. We have to build a case. We have to build a case so that you can receive. Because once you see all of the little kingdoms that have been taught erroneously, and you start seeing them broken down, then you can move. Uh, you can move as the Lord wants you to move. Verse ten, chapter ten, verse ten. When they came to the hill there, behold, a group of prophets met him. The spirit of God came upon him mightily. We talk about Saul, so that he prophesied among them. So there's another indication when the Spirit came upon a man, and Saul was not a prophet, but he prophesied when the Spirit came on him. And it came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied now with the prophets, that the people said to one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, how do you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How do we today, how does, how does, how does that happen for us? Well, first we need to find out where the promises are that where we can receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost, by the way, the, the Old Testament word for spirit is rock. And the Hebrew word means wind. It's, it's breath. And it could be a sensible or even violent exhalation. We go to Proverbs 1 and 20. Let's see if God talked about this in the Old Testament, leading us up to the New Testament. Most of us know about Joel, but let's see, let's see what he's doing. Proverbs 1, Proverbs 1, starting at verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O night ones, will you love simplicity, and scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. And he goes on, and then he rebukes them. Go to Isaiah 44, start with verse 3. 
For I will pour out water on the thirsty land. When you, when you become thirsty, when you know that God has more for you, when you see somebody that has been changed by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it will do one of two things to you. It will either plant in you a desire to have that and to do whatever it takes to have that, have him, or it will turn you off. It will turn you, no, I don't want to do that because of teachings. You know, if you if you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to speak in tongues and you're going to babble on crazily and you're not going to be able to control that and you're not going to be able to do this, you're not going to be able to do that. Those are none of those are true. None of those. None of those are true. Isaiah forty four, verse three, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on all your offspring and my blessings on your descendants and they will spring up among the grass. We're going to grow. Why? Because the spirit is on you. You must grow like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I'm the Lord's and that one will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand belongings to the Lord and will name Israel's name with honor. We will all be extolling praises for God in the way that he puts it on us to do that. And not all of us will do it the same way. Praise God that he's made us different people. Praise God that he's allowing us to be who we are if we'll hide in him. Then you, then, then the one that everybody really knows is Joel. Go to Joel chapter 2, starting with verse, let's start with verse 27. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy, prophesy. The connection, the Holy Ghost is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he, that's what Jesus said he would do in John 14 and in John 16. And we'll study that. But, and Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So if he's going to reveal him to you, he's going to release that in you. And that's not necessarily gift of prophecy. That's part, that's inherent in the character and the authority and the nature of the Holy Ghost. And he will come out about after this, I will pour out of my spirit on all mankind, and on your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I'm I'm not teaching on all of the rest of that prophecy, and, and Dave has uh, a book on that, uh, but this is about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now, there is where you see the promises of the Holy Ghost, okay, that God has meant it to be there. And it's completed in Acts 2. We're going to get there, but we're not going there right now. When you receive the Holy Ghost, when you receive the Holy Ghost, what do you receive? Well, you receive the Spirit of Truth. He's a helper. He's a teacher. He's a comforter. He's a revealer of truth. He gives orders and directions. He causes his witnesses to have power. He's a reprover. He prophesies. He restrains us from going in different places, like he did Paul. He's a sanctifier. He's a renewer of our soul. He has gifts, and we can pray in agreement with him according to Jude 1 and 20. Let's talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost. In Luke 1, 5, let's go there. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias, Zacharias at the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God, and the 
appointed order of his division, according to the division of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing in the right side of the altar with incense. And Zacchaeus was troubled when he saw this. Verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this is for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent, unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you do not believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in proper time. And then he goes home. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God in the city of Galilee, but it says... It says that Elizabeth, that John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. That's in verse 115. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Ghost while he's yet in his mother's womb. That's 115. That's by God's choice. Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth, go to verse 141, after she has, this is again, being filled with the Holy Ghost, being touched by the Holy Ghost, in verse 41, and it came about, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, she's prophesying. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who has believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Go to Luke 2.25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into the arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Now, Lord, thou hast let thy bound servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen the salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples. And then he prophesied a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. We should be a company, and I think Brother Dave will agree with this, we should be an, a company of prophets armed with the Holy Ghost, innate with the abilities of the Holy Ghost, according to what Jesus said, he will come and he will prove us of sin and he will lead us into righteousness and he will guide us into all truth and he will let us hear his voice. And these gifts will be imparted unto God's children. We ought to be an army that we don't need weapons. Like Bob and I were talking or actually emailing today about... It, it, it takes a revelation to understand that you won't have to fight, that God is our fighter. God is our commander-in-chief. God has all the weapons installed in his children that they'll ever need. Amen? Let's look at um, Luke 4 and 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led about by the Spirit into the wilderness. Let's look at Luke 11 and verse 13. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? That forevermore ought to settle it in your mind that if your heart is right, you might not have to verbally open your mouth and say, Father, I'd like for you to baptize me with the Holy Ghost because Jesus knows your heart. But if your heart is right, you can you can be baptized in the in, in the Holy Ghost with teaching or without teaching. But you cannot be baptized in the Holy Ghost unless you are saved. And that is that is that is the all consuming criteria of what God wants to do and how you receive the Holy Ghost. To receive anything from God, you must know that you're in the family. 
and uh, to get in the family. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it, if you go there, you can see that, um, you can see what he's saying. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. It says uh, that the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and have children and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. That's in Romans 8, verses 16 to 17. When you accept the truth, you'll know in your heart that Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and might have it more abundantly. That's John 10.10. 10. And if we'll hide these scriptures in our heart, the truth will bear witness. And, this, and God will do whatever it takes to move us from point A to point B. That's, that's exactly what he's doing. That's what he has men in my heart and belief. That's what he has men like Dave doing. That he's requiring of us. He's stretching us. Uh, and I think that most of us that uh, minister with unleavened bread and are involved with uh, uh, counseling and prayer, you can see how God is stretching his people. He's stretching them. Well, you're probably saying that all sounds good, but, you know, do I need the Holy Ghost? You know, I don't, I don't you know, this talking in tongues business and babbling in unknown language and all right, you know, I don't, I don't really need that. I, I don't want you to mess mess my theology up and mess what I'm, what's going on in my life. Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus wants to do. He wants to get in your life and turn it upside down so that he can mold you and shape you and break you and break me and break us and, 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 and then put us back on that powder's wheel and then reshape us to what he wants us to be. You know, there are questions like this, and, uh, and I, having taught this as often as I have, I, I, and I'm sure Dave has too, and Bob, and some of you, some of you others out there, that, um, oh, I need to share this with you. It just came to me that um, one of the members of the prayer team that y'all know, and I'll just call him Arthur, uh, he and I have been chatting on the phone off and on, and he asked about the Holy Ghost, and we began to talk, and I said, well, you can receive the Holy Ghost over the phone. You're saved, aren't you? Yeah, I said, well, you know, uh, let's just pray. And we prayed over the phone, and he got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost has changed his life. He, he'd be a good one to give testimony of, since uh, I think a lot of you know him. Um, but if that is the job. He's the author of change. He's the agent of change. He changed Peter. Peter went from not being able to stand up and figure out what was going on to being a powerful man of God through the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And does God really want you to have the Holy Ghost? Sure he does. He says, receive the Spirit. He told his disciples. He breathed on them. And here, here, let's talk. Now, I'm trying not to jump around. I'm trying to get where well, I don't get too long. Uh, but Jesus, in John 20, he goes to them and he breathes on them. He said, he breathed on them. He said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Then he tells them to go into Jerusalem and tarry for the promise from the Father. So is that contradictory or is that confusing? No, not at all. Because he also, in Luke 9 and 10, he put the Spirit of the Lord, he put the Holy Spirit on them. They went about, he told them to cast out devils, to heal the sick. Told him to raise the dead. He said that in Matthew also. But when he left, the Spirit came to stay. When he left, the Spirit came to stay with us. So were those disciples, were those disciples when they traveled up to the upper room, were they saved? That's something you'll have to read in your word and make a determination in your heart. If you believe those 120 people that were sitting in that upper room praying in oneness, for the promise of the Father, if they were saved. Because if they were saved, then the, bat the wind that came on them and baptized them with prophesying and with tongues, that, that would be something they would have already received to, according to a lot of faiths. 
And that's not true because they didn't receive it till that day. They didn't receive him until that day. But there's a lot of, you know, you have questions, you know, how do I receive the whole? Okay, Rex, I understand, but how do I receive the whole? What do I have to do? Is he really a person? Yes, he's a third person in the Trinity. We've already know that God wants you to have him because he keeps saying in the Old Testament and New Testament, I'm going to put my spirit on you. It's important. Will he change your life? If you allow Jesus to mold you, yes. If you say no, then he won't. But he will make you miserable. If that's your decision. Who promised? Who promised the Holy Spirit? Let's go to John chapter 14. Start with verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You would have thought that you would have put, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and then you can ask me anything, and then I'll do it. But that's not the way it's written. He trusts us before we trust him is basically what's going on here. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you. Mark it down. He abides with you and will be in you. Those are two different things. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me because I live. You shall live also. Go to John 15. Start at verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. And I could stop and teach on just that one scripture right there because we walk on some very thin, thin, thin ground when we reject the Spirit of the Lord. When we call speaking in tongues as of the devil. When we say it's not of God. When we say things that are written down plainly for us to read that are no longer valid for today, that nothing in this Bible has passed away. And I believe I stand on good ground on that statement. There's not one thing in here that is gone. It's all alive and well and breathing and is in Jesus. But they have done this in order that the word may be fulfilled. This is written in their law that they hated me without a cause. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. Go back to John 14. Just one page back. Start with verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know at which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breast one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter therefore gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom you are speaking. And he, leaning back, thus on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 25, 14. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So he's a teacher, like I said earlier, and he is asking and saying that he's going to bring everything that he said to you to your remembrance. The only way that you're going to get him to do that is you've got to read it. You've got to get it inside you first. You must eat it, and then he'll bring it to your remembrance. We know that the Holy Ghost is the counselor. We know that he's the teacher. And I gave a list of other things that we know that he is. And when was the Holy Spirit given to us? And how can we be assured that he really wants, he's really for today? Well, let's go to Acts. Chapter 1, verse 4. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Where did he promise that? Promised it in Joel. 
And why would he do that? Because he'd been doing it since Genesis, or actually since Numbers. He'd been placing his spirit on men so that they could operate in his authority and in his nature and in his character. We can't do it any other way. Which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Then they ask him things, but he says in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now I ask you this, where is the power? If Jesus right there said, you will receive the Holy Ghost and you will receive power and you will be witnesses, we're going to find out what some of this power is. Where is it? And why is it not operating? What have we done? What have we done to the water? Like it says in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34. What have we done to the water? Acts chapter 2. First, we're to wait. Well, you don't have to wait anymore because the Spirit's been given. You and I don't have to wait. All you have to do is ask. Second, in Acts 2 and 39, for the promise, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. Verse 38, should have read it first. And Peter said to them, repent and let each of one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, he, he set up some criteria right there that when you get up to Paul, Jesus just decides to do it the way he wants to do it, okay? But the key is, is you repent, and if you repent, then you, you call upon the name of the Lord, and being baptized is a recognition of being dead with Christ and raised with him in resurrection. And so what has happened is you're cleansed, and you are a perfect candidate for the, the Holy Ghost, your perfect candidate for Him. Can quench my thirsting soul, pure as water, make me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. Mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in you.